Hello. In this video, we will look at the High Renaissance in Italy with a close examination of three artists that represent the ideals of the Renaissance in Italy of innovation, perfection of technique, and overall aesthetic. Now, as the Gothic period ended and we moved into the early Renaissance, there was this renewed interest in classicism. Um, the term Renaissance literally means rebirth, and what's being reborn is the classicism of the Greco-Roman period. But in the Renaissance, instead of there being a specific focus on the collective development uh, or a, a, a whole society development of classical ideals, there's really more of an emphasis upon the individual development. So Renaissance humanism really focuses on each individual's goals to improve their own aesthetics, their own um, knowledge and understanding, and to develop their own techniques to the point where they could be considered a true Renaissance man. The, the ideal Renaissance man would be good at many things, not just at one thing or a few things. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, in many ways, represents the ideal Renaissance man in that he was considered to be um, knowledgeable and skilled at many things. Now, that doesn't mean that he was good at everything. Um, in fact, he, where many artists of the period were expected to do Whatever their patron asked, they were expected to create um, architecture, sculpture, painting, uh, what it, you know, re regardless of their background. Da Vinci was um, not never fully comfortable creating sculpture. Now that doesn't mean that he couldn't do it. It means that his skill set was really focused more towards two dimensional drawing and painting. Um, than it was with <clears throat> with three dimensional. Michelangelo is the exact opposite. He really would have preferred to focus solely on sculpture, um, but he was called upon to create paintings. Uh, and when um, when he was unable to uh, initially unable to to do that. He had to develop those skills to be able to create some of his most iconic works, like the Sistine Chapel fresco cycle. Now, <clears throat> Raphael, by the time of Raphael, towards the end of the High Renaissance, what we see is a, a move towards a specialization in art. By the 16th century and the 1500s, Artists are no longer going to be required by patrons to uh, do all things. They are they're going to be really allowed and um, to focus and specialize in one particular area, whether it be drawing or painting or printmaking or sculpture or architecture. And we're going to start to see that specialization develop through the 16th century, um, and that's going to be more common today. Now. Now, the first artist that we're going to look at is Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo is one of the most famous artists in all of history for a number of reasons. Um, I think what makes Leonardo so special is his willingness to risk and um, to be creative, even in, within the parameters, which could be difficult sometimes, of the patron-artist relationship. You know, we tend to think of artists as being very creative individuals, and they are, but that does not mean that, that all artists have complete autonomy. And even somebody as skilled <clears throat> as Leonardo still had to um, 
had to keep his patrons happy. And so the patron, the one paying for the work, was the one really who decided what the image was going to be, what the subject matter was going to be. And very often they had input on the composition as well. So for Leonardo to create a work that um, still um, provided that creative outlet and gave him what he felt like was his opportunity to um, explore those things that mattered to him and keep the patron happy could be a, a really difficult thing. <clears throat> How he managed to do that <clears throat> was to use areas within the compositions um, to, to explore his ideas uh, and the process itself to explore his ideas. And for, for Leonardo, innovation really is what marks his works as being um, the, you know, as representing the spirit of the Renaissance. He's, he was trying to um, make something new in all ways. And, and that could be difficult, especially when the patrons are, you know, requesting basically something he's already done multiple times. So this is one of at least 40 different versions of the Annunciation that he painted. Uh, the, in, the, in the Renaissance, it was not uncommon for a patron to request basically a copy or, or a very similar work to one that an artist had already executed for another patron. Basically, it was, for the patrons, it was like collecting um, their own version of things. There might be slight variations, but artists would become famous or known for a specific subject matter or a specific composition. Like this one, Leonardo became famous for his Annunciation with Mary seated uh, in front of this sort of classical Roman style book stand, um, the angel kneeling, uh, it's all, all happening in front of what actually amounts to a Renaissance sort of villa, and then this sort of long uh, atmospheric background or deep atmospheric background. And that actually is where Leonardo does most of his experimentation is with the backgrounds. The figures themselves are pretty typical for Renaissance style. They're painted with, uh, the whole painting is done with oil paint, which was uh, Leonardo's preference. Um, it was a relatively new thing and he became a master at it. Um, he was able to make extraordinarily thin layers of the oil paint, which allowed the paintings to have this sort of luminescent quality to them. Uh, the painting would seem to kind of glow with this inner light because of the way that the light reflected off of it. And it allowed, that oil paint allowed him to get incredibly fine detail. Now, as far as the compositions go and his experimentation, he's looking at the way that the atmosphere and the light affects how we see what we see the farther away from the foreground you get. So as you move through the back or towards the background, things sort of dissolve almost into this uh, kind of hazy atmospheric background. And that creates uh, a very believable effect of space in the work. And that's ultimately what Leonardo was experimenting with is to how to get uh, true atmospheric effects in his paintings. He wanted to make the paintings not just as realistic in the individual piece, but in the overall, um, the overall effect of the whole landscape. Art had not um, used landscape backgrounds in most cases. Uh, it was uh, it was much more common for figures to appear on very shallow or flat backgrounds. And so Leonardo was trying to add that believable element of the realistic background, the realistic space. <clears throat> and I think that that also plays into his, um, his interest as a naturalist. You know, 
Leonardo was not just an artist. He was an inventor. He was an observer of nature. He was, um, by some accounts, obsessed with um, hydrodynamics, the way that water works. He was obsessed with flight. He was uh, very interested in alchemy and experimenting with um, uh, the affecting elements, specifically metals, to be able to change metals and their, their elemental nature. Um, all of this was, you know, showed his interest in, in science and nature, and that is, is expressed in his art. Uh, these are two very famous examples of a very similar composition. You can see that they're, they're not quite identical, but they're very similar. And they are both known as Madonnas of the Rocks because of the rocky backgrounds. And and that's really the point. For for Leonardo, the background allowed him to experiment with different techniques and different effects and to choose subject matter that he was much more interested in. He probably, given his complete freedom of choice, probably would have painted uh, landscapes. But landscape painting was not... Um, was was not a a, a a subject matter that was deemed appropriate. Um, you were supposed to make figurative works, and specifically, very often, religious figurative works or portraits of important individuals or patrons. Um, and so, as such, he had to keep his patrons happy. Um, and the foreground figures do that. It's the backgrounds, though, that keep him interested and happy. And you notice, too, that how he's experimenting with different ways to uh, move the eye around the composition. You know, as you look at each figure and move from figure to figure and follow their gestures, you follow their eyes, you follow uh, the way, or you see the way that the figures are grouped um, it, in that sort of triangle shape, and then your eye flows around following either their hands or their gestures or their eyes, and you move from figure to figure. The, the figures and their gestures and eyes move you to the next figure, um, which was uh, which made the, the, the image seem a little bit more candid. Um, the, the figures interact with each other. They don't look out at the viewer, which was uh, not common. It was more common for figures in paintings to look at the viewer and engage in a more formal way. Um, and so all of this speaks to what um, what Leonardo is experimenting with is to who these figures are and, and why they're important and and it's all happening though in front of this background that that um, serves the, the purpose to keep Leonardo interested he wants to experiment with ways to make a background um, have a variety of space and ways to reflect what he's interested in looking at in nature, like the rocks and the water. Now, in his most famous works, we see these uh, his great skill at composition. This is uh, perhaps one of, if not the most iconic images in all of history. It's the Leonardo's Last Supper, um, and in many ways it was innovative, but in other ways, you can't help but see it as a technical failure. It's um, a fresco, meaning painted on wet plaster, applied to the surface of the wall. But Leonardo was disappointed in the different uh, color variations and the quality of the light and dark that you could get with fresco painting, and so, with traditional fresco painting. And so he experimented in true Leonardo fashion um, with uh, using oil paint, mixing it with different elements from fresco to create, uh, to try and create something new, a whole new technique. Um, the problem is, is that oil and fresco just will not work together. Um, fresco is, is uh, primarily water-based, and as such, you know, the oil and water evaporate at such different rates that it was just not possible to mix these two to, uh, to create a, a permanent surface. Um, <clears throat> even as soon as just a couple of years after he completed it, he was called back because of some pretty serious cracking that was happening uh, to the fresco. 
he tried to apply a, uh, a surface um, kind of varnish to protect it, uh, and that lasted for a while. It helped for a while, but overall, over time, it has been deteriorating for the last 500 years, and th they uh, predict that relatively soon, uh, within the next um, 50 to 100 years, uh, it's likely that the painting will uh, no longer be completely visible because what's happening is that the pigments are deteriorating to the point where certain elements you can't see anymore. Now, what makes this painting so unique and special is, is the way that he organized the space using that linear perspective. Those, the lines all flow to the center to Jesus, but then he also organized the figures um, and each figure group represents a kind of typical human response to what Leonardo is suggesting has just taken place in the scene. So here we have the Last Supper, and what he's imagining, Leonardo is, is that this is at the moment where Jesus has just told his disciples that one of them will betray him. And so each of the groups of three, each of the four groups of three, has what he, he considered to be a typical response to um, that statement, to Jesus' statement. And so uh, on the, the figures at the, the extreme right, those three, they are not, they seem to re respond in a way that says, what's he saying? We don't understand. Um, you know, then the figures at the extreme left seem to be saying, oh, it's not me. You know, I'm not sure what he means, but it's not me. Uh, the three figures to just to the right of Jesus, they are seem to kind of plead with Jesus to tell them who it is. And then the figures just to the left seem kind of conspiratorial to know who it is. And Peter, the older figure, even cups a dagger. And we see that, you know, he, he seems to kind of whisper into James's ear to say, I know who it is, and I'll be, you know, we'll do something about it. So the the overall image reflects uh, more of that humanity. Uh, instead of being very f kind of formal and, and uh, overly, um, uh, and giving a, uh, a more portrait look to the image, what we see here is an attempt to kind of capture that moment in the narrative and to, you know, say, well, if I were, this is Leonardo, if I were, you know, any one of these people, how would I respond or how would any normal person respond? And so that's what he's trying to create. Now, he also creates a very, very believable space. And we see, again, in the dark and light, we see uh, the figures against certain light areas, but we see some... Uh, use of framing. We see the figures framed and the windows in the background. We see um, an interesting use of the space of the table, the way that all the figures are on one side of the table, um, and very typical of a kind of feast of Leonardo's time that everybody would be on one side and then the servants would serve from the other, a very shallow table. So it's, it's innovative in a lot of ways. Um, in the way that he uses style, and the way that he uses uh, the composition, and the way that he uses perspective, it is very organized, and ultimately has been very effective. Leonardo's other great work is an individual portrait, um, the Mona Lisa. And a lot of recent study and scholarship has been done uh, to kind of examine the, the, the layers of the paint, and perhaps what it looked like and how it's changed over the 500 years since it was completed. Um, this is how we see it today with the kind of darkened colors on her dress, um, the kind of more muted colors. This is perhaps not what it looked like um, when it was completed. The more recent study of it has brought out a belief that um, the colors used to be much different, much brighter. All that brown used to be blue. Uh, 
Um, but over time, it has discolored because of the, again, Leonardo's insistence on innovation and exploration. He was experimenting with pigments, and those pigments have reacted to the light over time and changed from blue to brown. Now, um, much has been made about trying to understand why this, why she looks the way she looks, her sort of uh, kind of wry, enigmatic smile, um, her exa the exaggeration of her hands, um, who she is. Um, now, as far as many of those questions, they all might kind of fit together uh, in when you consider that um, that she's wearing a veil. Now, in their time, a veil did not mean a wedding necessarily, although a lot of brides were depicted wearing veils. Uh, a veil meant that the woman was pregnant. Um, and so if she, a woman's depicted as wearing a veil, um, not only is she pregnant, but very often in marriage portraits, women were pregnant because a marriage wasn't completely consummated until uh, the, the bride became pregnant pregnant to show that she could bear an heir. This is not most likely the wife of the patron. Um, it's, it's more likely that it's a mistress uh, of the patron and who's become pregnant and he has requested of Leonardo to um, paint her portrait as sort of a keepsake. Now Leonardo never delivered it, um, but all those details kind of speak to who she is, and why certain elements uh, are the way they are. Um, now, what makes the painting so innovative in terms of composition is the way that he manipulates the composition um, for effect. The, the horizon in the background is significantly higher on the right than it is on the left uh, to create a greater sense of depth in what is ultimately a very small painting. He uses, again, that atmospheric uh, perspective of things sort of fading into the background. And he uses a, an intense amount of what he called chiaroscuro, the light and dark. Um, the light seems to emanate from the figure. And, you know, she almost provides the light in the image. And there's so many very, very thin layers of paint on this, uh, probably more than 50 layers of paint on this painting to create that luminescent quality. So all of that uh, innovation of technique really and kind of um, created what has become a, an iconic image. Now, Leonardo was famous for many things. He was in, in some good, some bad. He was famous in, uh, for not finishing his paintings for not meeting his deadlines, for getting distracted or choosing to go off and do other things when he had a commission. Um, and here's one such example. This is a Madonna and Child with St. Anne that he never finished, even though he worked on it off and on for years. The patron insisted in uh, on delivery, even though it was un, unfinished. Um, but it's, it's a very unique example for us because it allows us to see his work. The background is still just a drawing. Uh, in certain areas of the foreground have a few layers of paint. Um, some have just the underpainting. And some he's actually started the process of applying the first few layers of the overpainting. Now, what, that tell, how, what it shows us is his multi-multi-step technique. You know, there were, um, part of the reason why these paintings were so elaborate and took so long is because it was a very lengthy process to apply all of these um, all these layers of paint one over the top of the other, and in between time you have to allow uh, for drying. The, the, you can't just paint over the top of the paint uh, the previous layer until it's dry uh, if you if you don't want those layers to mix. Now, for Leonardo, what he considered to be his, his greatest work and, the, and what he was most proud of is his sketchbook, his codex. 
Um, it's here that he worked out his ideas, that he made his discoveries, um, some of which he shared, some of which he didn't, um, that he you know, studied the natural world, things that he saw. He participated in autopsies. He spent a great deal of time studying things that he was interested in, like birds and optics and light and water um, and, and movement. And all of that played into his work. We see the evidence of it in his work in the way that he understands how figures move and then the possibilities. It's also in his codex where we see some of his greatest inventions. Now, some of those inventions were never built during his life, but he predicted things like the helicopter, um, especially in flight. Uh, he, he predicted or invented the hang glider, the parachute, um, and several other things that are commonplace today, but would not be uh, actually invented and produced for hundreds of years uh, after his death. Now, it's in these drawings that we see Leonardo working out uh, his processes of light and dark, the way he uses modeling and, and to create uh, shading and shadow to, to suggest the musculature. Um, and then at the same time, him working on um, just ideas that he has, uh, some of which will are, are ultimately we've kind of worked at the engineering that they're not fully possible, uh, some of which would work. Um, the, the drawing on the right is his, his attempt, one of his multi-attempts at a helicopter. Um, actually, it's not quite a helicopter because it doesn't spin. It's really more, it's a flying machine where that flaps, those big arms will flip up and down uh, based upon the person inside stepping on those pulleyed uh, kind of lever things. Um, and so as the fig person steps up and down, the, the wings basically flap. And his idea is that it, it could fly kind of like a bird would fly. Uh, I, I, that one never worked. And uh, the University of Cambridge in England actually has many of his sketchbooks now. And they have gone about actually building examples of some of his machines. And, and many of them, they believe, uh, would work or have worked. They've tested some. Uh, this is his version of a hang glider. And uh, instead of the, the person lying down, they sit, uh, but they have proven that even with his materials that available to him in his day, that this would have worked. Now, he spent several years in the employ of the Duke of Milan as a, a specialist uh, of designing and constructing military armature and defenses and things. Uh, even though he had no real experience at that, and it kind of shows in his plans. This is his his version of a tank. Uh, it was made out of wood. There's wheels in, under it, and what you do is two people get inside, and they walk it out onto the, the middle of the battlefield, and then they fire off the cannons that, that stick out the bottom, um, and it's supposed to, it would kind of blow out the legs of the men or the horses around it. The problem is, is that it would also have a lot of smoke that would come inside the cabin. Um, Leonardo's answer was to put those vents up top. Uh, never really worked, but, um, I mean, it, it would have worked for what it was designed to do. It just wouldn't have been very effective. Um, and that, you know, he, you can understand that considering Leonardo had never actually you know, been a, a soldier. Here's another example of a, an invention of his that would work, but you may not want to use. This is the first automobile. It's it, the, the mechanism to move it is uh, a giant clock works. Um, there's springs that coil to, like in a in the uh, in a clock, they would move the hands. They would move the to you know, to keep time. But here they're used to turn pulleys and gears to turn the wheels, the back wheels. And then you use that stick up front as a drive wheel, um, or a steering wheel, I should say. And that the problem is, is that the clockworks were famous for the springs, uh, basically just coming out of the mechanism. 
And what ends up happening is that they have, or what would end up happening if you were seated on top of it, is that it would, it could do some serious harm to your body because those are big metal springs and, and uh, they're and under great tension. And so you probably wouldn't want to sit on top of that as you're riding around, but it works. And that's, that's sort of the point is that, you know, Leonardo's thinking about what's possible and not necessarily about what's, what's uh, practical, but he's, he's definitely working out that, that this is theoretically possible. Now, in many ways, Michelangelo and Leonardo were opposites. They were opposites in their approach to many things. They were opposites in their uh, personalities. They were, they were very, very different. Where Leonardo was famous for his... Um, as a conversationalist, he was famously knowledgeable about many things. He was also very famously um, a uh, the kind of person who you know people wanted to be around. He was charming. He was um, well spoken. He was uh, he could you know read and recite and and write his own poetry and was knowledgeable about many subjects. Michelangelo famously didn't like people very much. Um, he, he preferred the solitude of his work. And so he saw, Michelangelo saw Leonardo as being um, kind of in self-indulgent. You know, he, he didn't see where Leonardo's was as great as everyone made him out to be because very often Leonardo's works were theoretical. They were uh, innovative, but they were also risky to the point where um, the quality of the work itself and the technique waned um, and lacked. You know, Michelangelo's focus was to try and create as something as perfect in technique as possible, um, and he wanted to to really be. The, one of the viewer to be impressed and overwhelmed with the quality of his work and never seeing um, a, a false step, basically. Whereas, and so because of that, he, he didn't take as many risks as Leonardo. Um, he wasn't quite as innovative as Leonardo, but his work was, uh, in many cases and in many times, uh, quite flawless in its execution. Now, he wasn't a painter. As he developed his artistic skills, he tended to, he focused on sculpture, um, but that didn't mean he couldn't paint. He was expected to paint, and he received a commission for his most famous painting from no less than the Pope, and in no less than uh, the Sistine Chapel, which is the Pope's private chapel. Uh, it is really the center of papal authority in the Vatican, and so this was a very, very, very big deal to get the commission to paint this ceiling. Um, but he didn't want the commission. You know, that, that's sort of the point for Leonardo and Michelangelo is that Leonardo would uh, kind of talk his way into things and he would talk his way out of situations when he'd made mistakes or there'd been problems. But Michelangelo's whole um, persona, his, his whole identity as an artist was tied up in the fact that he didn't, um, you know, he didn't make mistakes. He he didn't fail. His so and that was partly why the Pope commissioned him to create this ceiling is that he knew that he would do a good job. He knew that he would come through and give the Pope what he wanted. Even though Michelangelo tried to argue that I'm not a not a fresco painter. I'm a sculptor, and the Pope wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, and so Michelangelo spent several years first learning how to make fresco. And then second, um, actually executing the work. He chose as his subject a fresco cycle, uh, probably inspired at least in a little bit by Giotto and his fresco cycle from the Gothic. Um, and he chose as the, for his cycle the story of creation from the beginning of Genesis through the flood and Noah. And we see in several panels uh, divided up in this uh, kind of faux architectural style, um, we see the stories of 
God creating the sun and moon and God creating man and then man's uh, being cast out of the garden uh, and all culminating with uh, the image of the flood and Noah. There are more than 200 principal figures in the painting. Um, the, the most famous are the images of God and the creation, um, but there are all kinds of uh, very classically inspired sibyls and nymphs, and uh, you know they, they look very much like the more Greek classical works. Um, in most of those in carving, but that's that's kind of how Michelangelo saw it. Is he he sees himself as a sculptor, but he paints like he's carving a sculpture. So his figures seem very sculpted, and they are definitely very classically muscled. So here's God creating the sun and moon. Um, and his image of God kind of goes along with his image of the re relationship with man. He saw most of societies being overindulgent and being uh, less, you know, lacking discipline. And he sees God as this authoritarian figure. This is probably the most famous panel from the sequence. It's the creation of Adam or the creation of man. Um, and it was actually, in its time, quite controversial, mostly because of the pose of the two figures. Adam doesn't seem to sort of stretch to God. God seems to be the one stretching to Adam. And that, that really speaks to the attitude of the Renaissance, that it wasn't about all the things that surround man. It was about man, man that we were the center of all things, um, both collectively and individually. And so our relationship with God was based upon um, God's desire to see good in us versus our desire to strive towards the heavens. Now, the in this panel, we see a sort of sequence of events that is really the the fall of man, um, we see Adam and Eve, and Eve taking the, the apple from the serpent, the kind of part hybrid man or female figure with the serpent that's supposed to represent Satan. And then Adam and Eve being cast out of the garden by the angel uh, on the right. Now, there's... There's been uh, a lot of discussion over the years as to Michelangelo's figures and the way that he, he painted his figures. Um, even the, the female figures seem overly muscular. Um, and I think that part of that was Michelangelo's interpretation of what he saw as classical style. Um, classical. He looks back at classical relief carvings from the Renaissance, and he sees um, this heavy emphasis on musculature. But most of those figures were male. There were very few female figures for that, um, other than images of uh, the goddesses. And very often, the goddesses, especially Athena, were depicted as um, very strong and muscular and powerful as well. So... Um, there is sort of a, a connection, a classical connection, um, even if they, they perhaps don't seem quite so feminine. Now, even though he didn't want to paint the Sistine Chapel, uh, he, he finally ultimately agreed to accept the commission, mostly because uh, the Pope agreed to allow him to carve, if he would complete the Sistine Chapel, to allow him to carve the Pope's tomb, uh, and sculpt the, the Pope's tomb, which he later did. Um, but then after he, the, he received the, the accolades he did for the Sistine Chapel ceiling, he returned and painted the image of the Last Judgment. Now, this image show is sort of bookends with the, the first one. It's the beginning and the end. It's the creation story in Genesis, and then this is sort of the revelation, the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ to judge humanity. And 
Jesus is at the center, emerging out of that kind of halo of light, and he is this classical figure, and he is um, then dividing humanity into the believers and non-believers, and the non-believers are headed towards hell to be tormented. Um, Michelangelo very famously um, suffered from from depression and um, was again, not very fond of, of people, um, but also that, that kind of connected to his, how he viewed himself as well. Um, the, the, the tormented figure with the skin torn from the body is actually a self-portrait. That's, that's Michelangelo, you know, puts him his, his own face on that, um, skin. Now we've already talked about his version of David, but what we see is the is how important his um, his style of carving um, and how realistic and how he he chooses to make the figures. So he's trying to get absolutely every detail correct, um, and ultimately his high level of skill in technique in carving marble is what makes his works so impressive. This is his image of Moses, and what makes this his his ability so great was his um, his use of f form in a way at that where the marble doesn't seem like marble. It, it really seems like uh, to be the actual form. It seems almost molded. It seems impossible that he's carved this from marble um, because of the way that he was able to get such amazing fine detail in the, the crevices and the spaces in between, in the folds of the, the garments and the cloth, in the, the twists and turns of the hair, uh, in the expression, in the pose, in the, the subtle details of the the veins on the arm and the, the muscles and the way that everything works together to create this incredibly intense high level of realism. And that's ultimately what marks uh, Michelangelo's work is perfection. You know, his goal is to carve the marble so well that you believe in the perfection of the image. Now, Many argue that his finest sculpture is the Pieta, his image of Mary with the dead Christ draped across her lap and the way that she cradles the body in her arms um, and the, the just uh, incredible, believable realism of these figures. Um, you know, her hand cups underneath his arm and shoulder and she holds him and you believe that the weight of his body is pressing on her hand and her hand presses into his flesh and you believe the kind of the musculature and the way that his his body drapes across hers it's really really remarkable that um michelangelo was able to get such an incredibly high level of detail you know that's ultimately his goal, is to have flawless technique. And he spent his life, you know, sometimes 16, 18 hours a day, doing nothing but, but working uh, diligently on, on perfecting his craft and on creating this incredibly uh, high level of realism. Unlike, you know, this is sort of the opposite, complete opposite of Leonardo, who was always experimenting, who was always trying different things. Now, finally, Raphael is sort of a mixture of the two. He wants to have a high level of technique, uh, but he wants it to be in service of a, a believable aesthetic. Uh, a, you know, he wants it to be realistic. He wants it to be beautiful. Um, and he also wants a certain level of innovation. Now, his innovation comes in the relationship of his figures and the way that he composes the scenes. Quite simply, nothing dramatic here, um, but they're believable. They, they feel real. 
Um, he, he became famous for his images of the Madonna and child. And the, the infants seem like real infants. They act like real infants. You know, the, here the infant tugs at Mary's dress, and it's completely believable and, and ultimately very charming. That, that's that's kind of what, um, what Raphael becomes famous for, these very beautiful scenes of these figures that are very charming. And you know, he himself was famously charming as well, so you know, his art would reflect that. Now, he uses, he's, uh, there's an homage here to Leonardo, he uses a high level of intense lights and darks to get that realism, uh, modeling. Um, there's also an, an element of the, um, that detail in the way that he paints certain things. He's able to get these very ethereal drapes and these, um, and, and the, um, the halos, which are just sort of these, kind of gauzy things that surround the heads and all of that is a uh, really amazing that he's able to get that such fine detail because he's, he's learned, you know, he's a generation after Leonardo ultimately, and he's learned uh, how to manipulate paint to get that, how, how to get these really, really fine uh, and thin layers of oil paint. This is one of his most famous Madonnas. It's called the Alba Madonna. Um, and it was uh, painted to uh, show and reflect his, his favorite places, his, his homeland uh, of Tuscany, northern Italy. And uh, has this very pastoral background. And, you know, it's, uh, the, the idea of it is pretty simple. The figures uh, are pretty straightforward, Mary and Jesus and John the Baptist, and um, but it's this beautiful, rich color and the the richness of the backgrounds that um, Raphael becomes famous for. Now, he also received some uh, high level commissions from the Pope. He was actually at the Vatican painting at the same time that Michelangelo was there. Uh, he was painting frescoes in the papal apartments. And he chooses as his subject uh, for these two, there are two uh, mirror images of each other, um, uh, but he chooses as the subject uh, to represent the Renaissance. So on one panel, we see what he called the School of Athens. These are the images of all of the great philosophers, mathematicians, scientists, thinkers, uh, from Greco-Roman history at the center is Aristotle, and he chooses to paint a portrait of Leonardo as Aristotle. And then he cho the, the kind of brooding mathematician on the steps is Michelangelo as an homage to some of his, his favorite artists. Um, he f and it's all happening in this classical environment of the vaults and the ceilings and the sculptures. And this is his view of what he thinks is happening in heaven. Now, on the facing wall, he paints the disputation of the sacrament. So it's the organization of the heavens with Jesus at the center and God above, uh, the dove of the Holy Spirit surrounded by the saints, very orderly. And then below here, we uh, are arguing about, you know, how we, dis how we use the sacraments, uh, most notably uh, the sacrament of communion. Uh, with the host at the center. And so it's not nearly as orderly. It's a lot more chaotic here on earth, but it's, you know, this is what he sees as the hierarchy of both the church and the heavens. And he sees that as being a part of the relationship with man's intellect and man's philosophy, not, not in contradiction to, this isn't either Greek philosophy or, um, or religious theory, it's both. So, what Raphael represents at the end of the High Renaissance is that the for the la, for the previous thousand years, where the Church has sort of said that paganism and and uh, you know, uh, classical ideology and philosophy is antithetical to Church doctrine, now we see that Raphael represents. At the very, very center of the Vatican, he creates these images that represent this idea that it doesn't have to be one or the other, that it can be both. And that, that as classicism is reborn in the Renaissance, 
we see this emphasis on um, understanding how the classical can both inspire and influence uh, a renewed interest in religious doctrine. All right, so we're going to move on from the Renaissance, and we'll see how um, how the influential the Renaissance is on uh, on future generations of artists. So look for that in coming lectures.